your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Sometimes good intentions aren't good enough, and we need a little help to make it through the workday. Some people pray. Others put their noses to the grindstone. But now, you can take a different path and resolve workplace issues in a magical way. From the author of the Ghost of Hollywood series comes a brand new book, Workplace Spells, Everyday Magic on the Job, by leading author Marla Brooks. This easy-to-follow magical spell book will help you get past those pesky job-related hurdles. Whether you're new to the craft or a seasoned practitioner, you can make magic happen. Workplace Spells, Everyday Magic on the Job by Marla Brooks would make a great gift. Ask for it at your local bookstore or order online through SchifferBooks.com, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. Workplace Spells, Everyday Magic on the Job by Marla Brooks. Order your copy today. To stirring the cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Pair X Radio Network. I'd like to thank Midnight Syndicate for letting me set the tone for the show tonight with their song Dusk. And now that the creeped out mood has been properly set, I've do have a terrific show for you featuring a couple of very special guests and a very special house as well. We've got actor Butch Patrick. He's here, and you all know him as Eddie Munster from the CBS comedy television series The Munsters from 1964 to 66 and in the 1966 feature film Munsters Go Home. And joining Butch is field research medium, paranormal news writer, and our good friend Bonnie Vent. And the subject for tonight is the haunted Victorian house in Macon, Missouri, that belonged to Butch's grandmother and where Butch spent a great deal of his childhood. So, Butch, Bonnie, thanks for joining me and welcome. Hey, Marla, nice to meet you. Thank you very much. I love love the house. I've seen the pictures of it. I love it. I mean, it's beautiful and, and kind of looks like the perfect setting for a haunting. Butch, what was it like growing up in the house? Well, it was interesting because um, when I lived with my grandmother, the first time I stayed with her at length, I was in the fifth grade in Illinois in a small apartment above a a storefront on Main Street, like just a typical Main Street USA, Walt Disney type thing, cobblestone street, one stoplight, volunteer fire department, you know, ice cream (laughs) socials, the whole night thing. And then when I left that to do the Munsters, during that time, she was an antique dealer and she had so many antiques that she had to buy a bigger place. So when I came back three years later, she was in the naked house. She had moved from Illinois to Missouri and purchased this beautiful house on two acres. And it was, you know, I was used to her very small apartment, and she went from this small apartment to this massive house, and it was quite a change. Uh, the house itself was 
big and roomy, but it had a lot of interesting, because it was built in 1875, it had a lot of interesting architecture. It was a Queen Anne, and each room had a distinct, in my opinion, had a very distinct flavor to it. Uh, mm-hmm. It was on a hillside where you could look out and see most of the valley behind it. And I remember one of my most vivid memories was I would get up for school and I'd be eating breakfast and I could see the school bus about a mile away. So I would know exactly how much time I had to finish my breakfast, kiss her goodbye, make it to the to the bus stop on time. And that was kind of neat being a city boy coming back to these, the small town atmosphere because Geneseo had about 5,000 people in Illinois and Nathan, Missouri had the same amount of people, although it was a little bit more uh, spread out. Wow. I mean, it sounds lovely, but were you one of those kids who believed in things that go bump in the night? And did you ever see or feel anything paranormal when you were there? Because kids are way more open to that than adults are. You know, it's funny because I actually didn't. I was outside most of the time. I was either fishing with my grandfather or hunting or going with him hunting or riding with my friends' bicycles around and spent very little time inside the house where my sister with grandma, they were together constantly, and they both had activity with the ghost all the time. Mm. So did, did they talk about it? Did you know about it? No, not really. It was, really wasn't brought to my attention until I was an adult, and I was literally, uh, about two or three years ago, I was driving to the Midwest, and as people will do, you go back to sort of visit where you used to live, and I did this once 20 years ago, and I, there were people living in the house, and I stopped by and visited briefly and said hi to my old childhood friends, and then left and about 20 years later, which was a, would bring me up to a few years ago, went by again, and I called the same friend, and she says, well, did you know that not, but it, during this time, Grandma had died. 20 years ago, she was alive. I called her from the house and just, you know, brought her up to speed. And then Grandma died about 10 years ago, so um, when I went back this last time, she obviously, uh, I was going back just for my, own, for my own curiosity, and I called my friend, childhood friend. She says the house is vacant, the people that lived into it up to a few years ago, uh, went financially, you know, they went belly up on their business and they had to move out of the house. So when that happened, I thought, wow, this is crazy because I don't want the house to get knocked down because what they wanted to do, they wanted to uh, take the wrecking ball to it just for the materials because it had five fireplaces and all these stained yeah. glass and all, and all these crystal knobs and doors and it had one foot thick oak walls and the materials, the house was worth more uh, knocking it down to disassemble it so people could, you know, take parts of it for their own home. And I didn't want that to happen. So that's when I started the campaign of trying to uh, figure out a way to secure the house. Well, you said that um, that they knew about it and you didn't, but I understand that the basement when you were a kid was off limits to you. Why was yeah. that? Well, I think I just thought it was because it was dangerous, you know, and nobody ever went <laughs> down there. But but apparently it was because there was a tunnel. And there's a tunnel that goes to a house across the street, which was a um, a bigger house. I think it was built by the same people. And it was it was much larger and had these really scary like iron uh, an iron fence all the way around with these big iron gates. It looked something like The Shining. It was really amazing, and it was right across the street. And then we found out that there was a tunnel from our house to that house for whatever reasons I really don't know. I've been finding out uh, things almost on a on a, not a daily basis. But ever since I've been investigating this, I've been finding more and more information regarding the the history of the town, the history of the house from other people who have been just, you know, like Bonnie herself and Michael Lynch, who was out there, and some other people did some, some investigation on it more than I ever did. And I've been actually been educated by these people about, you know, my own house, or my, my grandma's house. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, Bonnie, you know a little bit about the background of the house. Um, uh, before, though, there was somebody in chat room asking where they could see pictures of the house, and I... I know, I think I know what your website is, Bonnie, but I'm not sure. So why don't you give us an oral of where they could go to have a look at it and then talk to us a little bit about the background of the house and how you got involved with Butch and the house. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of questions all at one time. Yes, uh, it is. That, the, the best way to get information about uh, about the house, I've made it very convenient for everyone. Uh, you just go to www.butch-patrick.com, and it'll take you over to uh, his booking page on my my business, Genesis Creations Entertainment, and uh, look for Macon Project, and there's a uh, seven-minute video that gives you some background on, you can actually see what the house looks like, as well as uh, interviews done by Butch's sister, Michelle, and her experiences with the lady in white. And the uh, former owner uh, also had what I would consider to be 
a full-on apparition um, based upon the details that he describes in his interview. Wow. Wow. Um, I just got a question from chat. Because it's in the real chat room, I'm going to ask it now, and either of you can answer, um, but it'll scroll by too fast later, and I'll miss it. Um, Ghostly wants to know, was the house ever involved in the Underground Railroad because of the tunnels? We think so, and if not that, uh, as, I, as I understand it, there was a lot of Shanghai going on just for the coal, the coal industry, that a lot of people were uh, sort of like taken against their will to, to go to work at the coal mines. As far as the Underground Railroad, that's a very strong possibility. It would surprise me, especially when you see the house across the street. Uh, it's so big, and uh, it, it actually wound up being a home for unwed mothers at one time, and then, believe it or not, the prosecutor of Macon Monmouth, I think, uh, owning it for a time, and he wound up actually getting murdered uh, by a drug dealer yeah, because he, uh, that he was representing. I think it was a defense attorney. Maybe it wasn't the, the defense attorney or the prosecutor. I think it was the prosecutor. Hold on. But anyway, there was a murder involved in the house as well, as, as mm. the story keeps getting better and better. Yeah, really. Yeah, well, there, was also, there was also another uh, murder in the the, uh, the Wardell family was very prominent uh, in Macon. And it was during a very transitional time from farming into the coal industry. And they're the ones that brought that to, to Macon, the Wardell family, or at least they're credited for that. They're also credited for switching the railroad into using coal uh, for the first time. And uh, so one of the, uh, the stories, this is actually uh, the, the Wardell house, which is a different house, but it gives a history about the Wardell uh, family. And the uh, the senior, uh, Thomas Wardell, uh, decided to go to his coal mine uh, on a day where they were all protesting for bad treatment, whatever. And so he arrives on his horse and buggy and goes and talks to the, the coal miners and says, you know, if you don't, you know, get back to work, I'm going to bring the Scandinavians in to replace you. <laughs> and he... <laughs> goes back to his horse and buggy, takes out his gun, fires three shots into the air to scare the crowd, except that what happened was as he turned around, someone from the crowd shot him in the back of the head. And because it came from the crowd, they never did figure out who killed him, but he died instantly. Mm. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing with uh, with Macon because Butch tells me that it looks like Mayberry, you know, from the Andy Griffith show. Uh, but it does have this darker uh, undercurrent uh, history going on, too, which is why I think that there probably is activity. There cer- it certainly fits into that framework of a, of a location that would have some activity. How old is the house? Uh, it, was it was built, built in 1875. Yeah. 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 Wow. And it, wow. It's, it's it's pretty big. You know, Butch was talking about how big it is, but uh, according to the real estate agent, the first two floors, each one is 1,560 square feet. And then she's not really sure how what the square footage is on the third story. <laughs> <laughs> after that, after two stories like that, who cares? <laughs> it's a big so, house. Yeah, you could you could ramble around in there for a long time and never see another person. Uh, and it does have all the original staircase and the wood flooring and trim and uh, stained glass. And uh, it actually reminds me of the Villa Montezuma that's here in San Diego, which is a much more eclectic uh, Victorian. But uh, the Queen Anne Victorians is something I'm very drawn to anyhow. And it just seems to be a little bit of a truism that they tend to have more activity than other kind of houses. And maybe it's because of the time frame, you know, very tumultuous times uh, when these houses were built. Mm -hmm. So maybe it has to do with that and also uh, a repressed time. You know, people kept their feelings kind of stuffed inside. Uh, So I don't know, but Victorians have always been an attraction for me. Yeah. Well, one, one thing, let me, let me let me add this really quickly, is when I was back there recently, it was the first time I did go into the basement all, in my life, you know, as an adult. <laughs> and that basement is very, very scary. It really, it reminded me, first of all, the stones and the layout reminded me of the Munster's dungeon. Uh, yeah. Very, very big rocks, very big foundation. And then with the, um, when you would walk around, it was 
up in the normal house, it didn't bother me much. I my hair didn't stand on end, but when I got down there, I really felt the presence. If I was going to probably say which which was the most haunted possibility of the area, it would have to be for me. It was the, it was the basement down there near the tunnel. Very scary stuff. Wow, I mean that's got to be neat. Um, would you, as an adult, and and you're not in the Paris field exactly? Would you go down there and spend the night in the basement? Alone. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you why I would, because my sister told me, and you'll see this if you go to the video, she's never had any issues with uh, feeling scared in that house, even though she wasn't in the basement, she was up around the stairway. But yeah, I would do it and not until something came came up to cause me not to want to stay there, I would I, I would give it a shot, sure. <laughs> Brave. I, mean, I want to see, I want to see the, I want to see something, I really do, I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, I've been with Bonnie on a lot of, uh, we have we did a lot of little excursions in various places, and I'm really looking forward to you know seeing. I've kind of been pushed aside a little bit by an entity, and I've I've seen things move back east when I was at the Paramount Theater and this and that. But I've never really had a full blown visual, you know, and I'd like to see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but one of the things that's interesting, Marla, with the uh, the description of the former owner is that, um, and you'll see this in the video, but he talks about the fact that his wife had always experienced this female spirit, but he never had, kind of like, an, you know, oh, that's just a woman thing. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and then he talks about, but there was one morning, it's 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting having my coffee, and I just happened to look up the stairway, and he saw the image of this woman, and he described it pretty much the same way that Butch's sister Michelle described her. Uh, in her 30s with upswept hair. And he talks about the fact that as he's looking through, and there's actually light coming in through the window behind this apparition that he's seeing, and that she put a shawl around her shoulders, and that shawl was so detailed, he could see the actual pattern in the shawl. And then I thought this was kind of cute, too. He remarks how graceful she is because she didn't use the hand railing to come down the stairs. (laughs) I was like, well, she doesn't need a hand railing. No, she felt mm, she could float instead. It's so much easier. Yeah, she is. Yeah. So what do we know about the lady in white? Just that, or is there other things that other people have experienced with her? Uh, Uh, As I I understand it, didn't she die in 1905? Right. Well, there. Um, Michael Lynch, I think, thinks he has identified who this person is, but I haven't seen any of the research on it. So, um, but his his feeling is that uh, this is Lizzie Wardell, and she was given the house as a wedding present from, you know, she's a member of the Thomas Wardell family. And uh, interestingly enough, she married a man, uh, Harry Ruby, who actually became a financier in the motion picture industry. Mm. Uh, So they actually left Macon and went to Hollywood for a while and then came back. And when they came back, they actually built another house. And that house still exists today, too. It's also a Queen Anne, and it's a bed and breakfast in Macon. Mm. So that house still exists. So... Uh, Michael Lynch, who's a researcher, paranormal researcher out of St. Louis, he did some actually hands-on research. I haven't been able to go to the house yet, and I'm dying to get there. Uh, yeah. But uh, his feeling was that uh, it's Lizzie Wardell because she loved this house where Butch's grandmother lived and wasn't so crazy about the new house, perhaps. Uh, because there seems to be, in his estimation, a tie-in between... Uh, her death and the appearance in the former home. So another, there, was, there was no lady in white in the home reported prior t- to her death. Mm-hmm. Did she die of natural causes, or, or do we know anything about that? I don't know anything about that at this point. So we, I still Michael have to we, we thought, or at least I was under the impression that he had given me the impression that she fell or was pushed or something that died at, at the base of the stairway where she's always seen. That's what I was told. But, you know, who did, it might be speculative. speculative. Right. Well, Bonnie, you do channel spirit. Um, so at some point, will you get there and will you try and channel her? Or, here's the $64,000 question, can you channel her from here? 
I don't think so. I think I really need to go to the location and pick up that energy. And there again, I think there's multiple things going on. Uh, the energy in the basement that Butch is reporting sounds very different than the energy of this lady in white. Mm -hmm. And and that's usually the case when you go into a location is that there's multiple things occurring in different areas at different times. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that's the next step is to actually, uh, you know, as Butch said, you know, let's go have an experience. And we all go to the house, and now that we think we have the house saved, because that was, you know, the, the first challenge was to make sure that the house didn't get demolished, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, you know, to where we wouldn't have access to it. But we think we probably have that worked out. And so the next thing would be to actually go there and uh, try and establish communication and get it directly from this lady in white as to who she is and why she's there and what's her story because right. we really don't know for sure we can speculate right. historically but but you know we don't know yet well early on when michael when i first met michael in st louis a couple of years ago and i told him the story and, and he was kind enough to take over his cameras and his equipment and whatever in, in, in my absence because i had i wasn't there and he basically was excited he said that we could find some activity here this is going to be gold for you because it's a great property and you know who you are and having lived there and you know we were thinking this would be a a, a very good possibility for a show of some mm -hmm. sort so when he failed, when he went over there and got back with me he was very excited because in his opinion he had seen multiple entities and and the lady and this and that so i was like this is really cool instead of just having one ghost he thought we might have as many as 10 or 13 or 12 or whatever multiples so mm -hmm. at that point in time, I got very excited about the possibilities of where this might lead to. And then I, at this time, I had to talk, spoken to Bonnie about this, and then Bonnie came on board, which made it even better for me because I'd known Bonnie so much longer. And between Bonnie and Michael and the key police and my sister, it just seemed to be falling into place very nicely. And the house was uh, available and vacant. It had been foreclosed, not quite foreclosed upon, but it had been in a holding pattern with the bank to where it wasn't available to anybody else to come in and buy it, which was very good. Well, sometimes things just fall into your lap, you know, when they should, yeah. because they're supposed to. And, and yeah, it sounds I like agree. this is kind of working like that. So the ideal scenario here now, Butch, is for you to purchase a house and, and live there. And well, um, go ahead. The plan, is, the plan is for me, I was at Long Island with a friend of mine who is a real, a real estate you know, mobile back in Long Island, and he also owns radio stations. And I told John, because I'm just coming back, I was uh, basically, I've just been sober, clean sober for a little over three years now. So my business associates and my business myself is just gaining a foothold in credit and this and that. I couldn't buy the house myself, so I had to find someone to qualify to buy the house. And I asked John if he would do it, and he agreed. So we thought that if he wanted to do a syndicated radio show with me, and I didn't want to move to Long Island, so I thought, would this be a cool thing to do to broadcast a syndicated show from, from my childhood home in Macon in the middle of the country and have a haunted overtone or paranormal overtone to a, uh, a show, which was I thought was interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. Then, aside from that, the people that were in it beforehand, the Keithley, they wanted to turn it into a bed and breakfast. They had actually done some structural uh, re, you know, regrouping of the rooms and putting bathrooms here and bathrooms there to make it into a four-bedroom bed and breakfast. And I thought, well, that would be a good idea because we could do a haunted bed and breakfast owned by Eddie Munster, child at home, and then Keith, uh, Mr. Keith, Stephen Keithley could actually run the bed and breakfast because that's what he would plan about doing anyway, and they're still in town. So for me, they were photographers, but at the same time, if I did this bed and breakfast, I don't know how to run one, and he does. So it made sense that we could do uh, multiple situations, the, the breakfast, the bed and breakfast, the radio show. The, the house has multiple uh, pot has potential for multiple things. We could do weddings there. We could do special events that could be used for movies and so on and so on. Yeah. Hey, well, it, I mean, it sounds great. And I just got a comment from the chat room. And I'm, Bonnie, I was just going to send this note over to you in Skype. When Butch is talking, do you kind of hear – now? Rusty in chat says she's hearing like a giggling or crying or a child humming or something like that. Um, I'm hearing it too. I'm not sure if it's Skype or, or what. Would or Have either of you heard it? No, I'm not hearing it at all. And there's there's no children giggling at my house that I know of. <laughs> no, not here. Yeah, it just, I don't know. I, I heard it from the very beginning and I didn't want to say anything, but I think it's... Um, 
I think it might be Skype, but it's just that people are taking notice in chat that, you know, maybe Butch, you've oh. got some friends over there with you that you don't know about. No, yeah, no, I'm sitting here, just sitting here in my sister's kitchen table, and she's in the back room watching TV, so nobody here. Okay. It's always fun when we get stuff like that in the middle of a show. Yeah. There's, there's been like some what I would consider to be above and beyond synchronistic kind of things that have uh, happened. And one, actually, I didn't even know at the time, involved Butch's sister, Michelle. Uh, she owns a, uh, a storefront, uh, Keys to My Castle. Is that right, Butch? Keys to My Castle? Yes, Keys, Keys yes. to My Castle. Yes. And she has, if you go over to her website, you can see the whole history of why she decided to develop that business. And it has everything to do with her grandmother and the collection of skeleton keys. Well, before I even heard anything about this project or the house or anything, I had no knowledge of it at all, I kept getting this impulse to go buy skeleton keys. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you can, and, and they, they were everywhere. Every time I looked at something, there'd be like this big giant skeleton key on the wall or whatever, and it was pestering me so much. I said, "Okay, fine. I'm going to go buy some skeleton keys, and I'll just put them in, you know, a little, a little uh, money bowl, you know." Uh, and so I actually did. And then, you know, I hooked back up with Butch, and he was talking about, you know, the, and as a matter of fact, it was Michael Lynch that mentioned it to me, that there were skeleton keys that were found in the house, and he put them on the table when he was doing the interviews that are in the video, and he said that he couldn't find them again. They didn't fit any of the doors in the house, and they yeah. disappeared, and he couldn't find them again. And then here I, you know, go out and get all these skeleton keys. And then I find out that Michelle is actually fulfilling a promise that she made to her grandmother about, you know, how come keys are so plain? You know, they need to have, you know, be fancy like they used to be back in the 1800s. Wow. And so she developed an entire business based upon that. And they used to go out and um, shop around for antiques, and that was one of the things that she used to pick up all the time was skeleton keys. So I think I, I think uh, I think Grandma has a little bit of an influence going on here as well, as they will be. You know, they do that very often. Now, see, I love skeleton keys, but if I were in that house, I'd be eyeing those glass doorknobs. I think I'm turning into Aunt Clara in my old age or something because <laughs> they just I love glass doorknobs. There's a lot of them. Yeah, exactly. How many rooms is in that? Does the house have? Oh goodness. Uh, let's see. You okay, went in the kitchen, the, the main room. One, two, three, four. Dining room. Five. Like five really large rooms on the bottom, and then uh -huh. you go up the stairs. And then the upstairs is it could be probably as many as right now. It's set up with four bed, breakfast, four bathrooms, four bedrooms. Uh, so basically, it's you know maybe a total of ten or ten or eleven rooms. Wow. Not that, not that many, actually, but they're large. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can't even imagine trying to keep a house like that clean. It's and huge. Those are five fire, it's five fireplaces. Wow. Well, that was that was all the heat they had back then. Yep. So, yeah, yep. but can Absolutely. you imagine trudging up wood up to the third floor to keep yeah. it warm? Well, you know, actually, what I liked that was really interesting for me is it's got this huge porch wraps around the whole front of the house, which is really nice, and then there's a carriage house down the hill where obviously, you know, the, the horses and the carriages were kept or whatever. And they turned that into a, a photography studio and living quarters as well down there, which is probably where I would wind up hanging out if I go back there and they turn into a, a, a pure bed and breakfast. It's nice that it has living quarters down the hill. And, and I remember this really, really well from, you know, I was 13 years old in the eighth grade back then. And the neat part about it is, is a lot of the, my cronies and my kids that I grew up with and went to school with are still in that town. So that's fun. Wow. It is. And and then how how interesting that that you became Eddie Munster, you know, and and so you go from one kind of haunted house to another. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of like yeah. that. Yeah. Kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, and it's fun the fact that we were talking when we were trying to explain what what this show could possibly be like, and you know, you think of Andy and Mayberry and the Munsters meet in the Twilight Zone, something like that, you know. <laughs> I like that. Well, what does I hear about plans, perhaps, for a research lab in the basement that's Grandpa Munster style? 
Yeah, I wanted to do that. If I if I had my way, uh, I would like to do the basement just because people enjoy the most. I would just I can't think of anything else to do with it other than that because it's mm-hmm. just naturally as soon as you look at it, you immediately connect to it looks just like the dungeon did the muster house. So why not have a little bit of a you know little, little fun with it and turn it into something that people might get a kick out of coming down and seeing it photo ops and especially if it's haunted. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you never know if Al Lewis might be floating around there just for. Kicks and giggles, right? Well, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character in real life. Actually, with infinite right? budget, we'd we'd want to put you know all of the the latest uh, paranormal research gadgets you know down in the basement, mm-hmm. and it it sounds like all we need to do is turn them on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the activity's already there. Well, don't forget we the big a, punch bowl full of dry ice. I mean, for atmosphere, you know. The, well, the cauldron. <laughs> well, yeah, I, that would be, you know, my it's preference. Not, it's funny, the name of the show is, I mean, it's funny because uh, Lily was always cooking in the kitchen and she was always stirring up a big cauldron of whatever we were eating. The gruel was for the day, and it was usually oatmeal. <laughs> I know, I, I got my little tiny cauldron here that wouldn't fit the bill, but, but a nice big fat <laughs> bubbling cauldron just sounds really nice. No, I mean, it, there are people in the chat room, they're talking about how much they love the Munsters, and, and one of the questions was, um, are you the only cast member still around? No, both Marilyn, the first Marilyn, Beverly Owen, the first 13 episodes lives in New York City. Pat Priest, who most people remember as Marilyn, is in Idaho. Okay. I see her quite often. I, don't, I haven't seen Beverly since the show, although I did speak to her on the phone maybe six or seven years ago. Pat, I've seen several times. Uh, there's kind of like a monster reunion uh, occasionally here and there for me and her in the cars uh, from the show. Um, this is the 50th anniversary. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of the show, so I've been working very hard with a book called MonsterMemories.com because all the people who come up to my table when I get out and about and come up with these great stories of what the monsters meant to them. And it's, you know, they've got these wonderful, fond memories of this time in their lives or even kids today watching it for the first time with their, their parents and their grandparents. And it just seems mm-hmm. nice what I'm doing is I'm doing this uh, book with just nothing but stories of what the monsters did to mm-hmm. viewers in America. And it's coming together really nice. It's really scary when you said it was 50 years ago. I mean, really scary because that means we're really old. You know that, right? Yeah. 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 You know, and the funny part about it is it's a unique one-of-a-kind show, that's for sure. But, you know, the fact is it was only on two years and there's not a lot of shows that really have that kind of impact and staying power uh, from a two-year show. And everybody remembers the address, you know, 13, 13 Mockingbird Lane. I was putting I, I was putting my mail out today to some businesses, and I put 13, 13 Mockingbird Lane as a joke underneath my name. And mm-hmm. people may not know me, but they may not know Butch Patch, but they certainly know that address. Wow. That, yeah, it, it's just, it's really kind of amazing. And, and it must have been for you as a child, um, the set and everything just, in of itself is pretty cool, you know. Um, well, it was. It was fun, and I had no idea how lucky I was. And it, it's funny, once in a while I'll get to go to an autograph show, and there'll be a lot of my contemporaries from other shows, like, you know, Bill Movie from Lost in Space, or Larry from Big Fan Dyke Show, or Johnny Provost, who's, who's married to a paranormal expert as well, uh, Lori yep. Jacobson. Yep. And um, these guys, like Larry said, it was funny, I never, I never do this, because I was, I was the only kid out there by myself, and they go, do you know how jealous we were of you? I go, what do you mean? He goes, I wanted Dick Van Dyke show, which was a top-notch show. He goes, but every kid in Hollywood wanted to be Eddie Munster because that was a cool show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys had the cool sets and the cool, you know, and the cool special effects and the cool cars. And I said, God, I never, I never knew it was like that. I go, but yeah, looking back on it, I was a pretty lucky guy. Yeah. Now the only thing you need to put in the making house now is a home for spot under the stairs. That's no problem. We got two acres for it to roam around, and maybe we can put it with the carriage house. <laughs> He'd be a great roommate, wouldn't he? Keep you That's warm in the winter. Sure. Keep you warm, exactly. You got it. <laughs> so, so what what's it going to take to make all this happen? Either the B and B, and then the um, well, the TV the show. B&B is- the B and B is ready to go. That's not a problem, and I've already cut some numbers and all that, and it's, it's, it can be profitable right from the get go. Not a problem there. Uh, the radio show, that's not a problem. John owns radio stations. That's what his business is in real estate. So the deal is I need to relocate anyway because I actually just moved out of my place in Anaheim. And I thought, well, if this is going to happen, I'll relocate back to make it for a year and use it as a base of operations. Uh, we did have a meeting with the Discovery Channel uh, recently about possibly something may happen with the 
maybe an episode of some sort coming up on, a, on, a, on an untitled show at this point. I, can't, I don't know how much I can talk about that. But we will. Most people that are in the know that know this stuff and don't be a figure, there's got to be some channel or some network out there that would like to see this at least uh, see the light of day at some level on, on, mm-hmm. on, a, on a cable or network channel. So that's that. If nothing else, the Vet Breakfast can fly, the radio, the radio show can fly, and we can just start there and see where it leads us. Well, I think networks are really looking for different types of ghosty shows. I mean, the investigation type show is kind of dwindling off a little bit. They're not jumping for that, but they're going. They're, the ghost thing will always be there because I just saw a show the other night called um, Killer Contact that Sci-Fi is putting on, and it's about a team that goes out and goes after like serial killers, like Jack the Ripper and things like that. Yeah. So it has kind of a historical bent to it, and obviously your house has some great history, and I'm I'm sure the more you dig, the more you're going to find, which is really very cool. So I think there's really a place for it. Um, And as it it turns out, you know, having met Michael just accidentally at, at uh, at the St. Louis Comic Con or whatever I was at, the main thing that's really excited me was everybody was talking about it, but when I when I got back together talking to Bonnie about it. That was what made me feel very strongly that there would be something that would happen because Bonnie's, as Douglas said, she's an expert in this field, and it needed somebody like that that was not to nothing against Michael or myself or whatever, but it needed someone that had paranormal, uh, a, a, a good foothold and, and a lot of strength in this field that would know what to do with it. Because you can have the best idea in the world, but if you don't know where to take it, you're in trouble. Exactly, and Bonnie, and don't blush, Bonnie, I'm complimenting you, but... Um Bonnie takes it a step further. I mean, it's not yes. just about going in and channeling a spirit. It's about researching. It's about really hands deep into it. And that's kind of what you don't see on TV so much. Um, you see a medium, but but they don't get into it as deeply as Bonnie does. And I think that's a real big plus. Well, you know, the thing was when I was talking to people and before I, before Bonnie came, came on, which I'm really happy she did eventually because I've known her for so long, but I was calling people, I go, you know, this is, this is not like a script where somebody just decided to write a script and we're going to try to sell it. This house existed. I lived in it. My sister did the business in it. I mean, the people lived there. This is all factual, real stuff that you couldn't write this kind of stuff if you, if you tried to. So that was, it. to me, that was the strength of this whole thing was this is a real story with real people in real time today. And I was there, you know, 48 years ago, it's 47 years ago, living there as well. And there's still people there that were in that town. So you've got this whole dynamic of this, of this town. It still has 5,000 people in it. Same people still living there. It's been almost in a time, time, a time warp, literally, like a, like a, like a portal. And you have, you have this thing going on. And I said, there's got to be something here that would work because there's just too much good stuff that's, that's legitimately there that isn't fabricated or, or manufactured. Mm-hmm. And and I don't know if Bonnie told me or you said it earlier, but the town is still the same as it was, you know, all those years ago. It hasn't changed much. It hasn't turned into, you know, a mini mall on every corner and, and a Starbucks so, every three blocks. If anything, it's kind of interesting what's happened. It's right where the two highways, before the interstates came into play in the 50s and 60s, it was right where 36 and 63 cross, north, south, and east, west. So there's, there's this trucking industry thing. What happened, the, the downtown area has kind of, lost a lot of the businesses and there's a lot of vacant buildings, but there's still a lot of them that still are there. You know, it's about 50-50. But what's happened is what you've lost at the downtown, which kind of gives it almost like a spooky, kind of like a twilight zone effect, walk like you're walking around in, in almost like a ghost town effect, sort of. Not mm-hmm. like ghost town, but the 5,000 people now, the businesses have just have got, got, got out of downtown and they've moved over to the, to the um, hotels and the truck stops and stuff that now are where the two highways cross. So the same amount of people still live in the county, but they just adjusted the population from the the town itself to the outskirts. Mm-hmm. It just it, it just sounds so neat. It, it's almost like a postcard. I mean, when you look at that house and take the picture, and people will go over and look at it, um, it does look like a picture postcard out of times gone by. And it, it yeah, it's a, because it's beautiful. It is a little bit spooky because it's a Victorian, and I think. We all kind of, you know, all these pictures you see of haunted houses are all Victorians, you know, because it kind of lends itself to it for some reason. Beauty and and scary kind of go hand in hand, I think. But, um, you know, just to be able to go there, be there, I mean, it's it's just fantastic 
the way things are coming together. And again, like I said before, sometimes it just happens because it's supposed to. Absolutely. And, you know, Grandma, I did my, my initial interest in the house was the same. It's on the wrecking ball, not really knowing what to do with it. But it was just synchronicity, as you said, something something just happened for a reason. Um, and why was I driving, you know, through the Midwest just for the heck of it? I didn't know that. I had no. I would have never known this house was vacant and was up for sale had I not just decided to go on a road trip. You know, mm-hmm. and that's what mm-hmm. I used to do with my grandma. When I was a little boy, she would drive all over the country, and she had this pink 59 Cadillac with a little U-Haul trailer on the back, and we would take for weeks to get to Illinois because she would stop all along the way at every, you know, at every stop or at every shop, and she would show me all the national parks and the meteor crater and the painted desert and all the neat things, and that's really why I have a love of this country so much is I saw mm-hmm. it from ground level at 40 miles an hour <laughs> going across country. And now here, here's the opportunity to really have something in, in, in and around the Macon area. I mean, Macon is Macon and the house is the house, but in and around the entire Missouri area around there, there's a lot of haunted activity. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of stuff that people aren't aware of that went on during this, you know, the house being built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. There was a lot of stuff going on that people would probably find to be very, um, see, uh, not seedy, but, you know, unseemly things were, were occurring here and there. There's a lot of, a lot of underhanded dealings and business dealings and people are dying and people are getting murdered and this and that. So it lends itself to a lot of probably uh, ghostly activity. Yeah, well, as you said, there's a lot of history there. And my, my catchphrase is always where there is history, there are ghosts and ghost stories. Yeah. And you put the two together and it's really cool. Bonnie, what what are you excited about getting there and, and doing? Is it talking, trying to channel the white lady or just – you know, absorbing all the vibes, what in it for you immediately would make you just, like you said, want to run there right now? <laughs> well, one one of the things is I have the ability to see a photograph and detect activity. And so I already know that there's activity there, you know, just mm-hmm. with my own uh, sense. Mm-hmm. And that makes me want to go further. That makes me want to find out what's what's the story. And two, historically, one of the things we didn't mention, which is a big thing, is the Civil War. This area was totally involved in the Civil War. And so you had, you know, yeah, you probably had a lot of death and a lot of um, instantaneous death, which is also conducive to there being activity. So, you know, to me, it's like, and, you know, it's funny when Butch said he wanted to put, you know, a lab in the basement. I said, mm-hmm. yeah, this this is a this is a whole research project in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, is- there's like so many layers that you can go through, and 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 that's that's what I do differently. I think than most people is I try and actually get the story from the spirit person, and mm-hmm. then we use what we know uh, historically to try and validate that information. And then it's not dry history that like you learned in school anymore. It's someone's mm-hmm. life and and how they felt about it because you you really get that sense of their their personality uh, and um, usually they're very emotional. Like anyone, you know, when you're telling your life story, you're very emotional about it, especially mm-hmm. if you know you had an untimely death or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's very dramatic and it draws you in and you just want to keep digging through and, and do what you can to get their story out so that maybe they can move on from there. And yeah. uh, Butch's sister, Michelle, also mentioned that this lady seems very, the lady in white, that she seems very sad and like mm-hmm. she's looking down and holding something. So mm-hmm. we don't we don't know what that is. And that's that's the draw to me. One is I see a visual of the house. And in looking at the footage, you get, you know, some shots of the inside of the house as well. And it just it just draws me in as it, it needs my assistance in some way. Because mm-hmm. everything I do is purpose-driven. So it just needs that information to come out to light a day. Right. Butch, do you think your grandmother might be still hanging around there? I'm sorry? Do you think your grandmother might still be hanging oh. around there? Well, she, I, I, I mean, she passed away up in Idaho, but you never know. I guess, you know, that would be more um, – she was a really strong woman. I'll give you that. Grandma was extremely strong. If anybody would be hanging around, it would, might be her. Yeah, I think so. And Michelle seems to think that as well. Well, if she loved the house and, and had an attachment to it, um, sure. 
you know, it's very likely. And, and Bonnie, as you know, in a blink of an eye, if you're in spirit, you can go anywhere you want and hang well, out. You, you know? Well, you know, well, you know what's, what's funny about it is you have this town and house, like I say, built in 1875. It's coming up, you know, it'll be 140 some odd years old here real soon. But uh, the whole history of the house and all the people and everything, you know, and the, the people, the players that lived in it, the families, everybody knows that house as Grandma Green Street's house and Eddie Munster lived there. So everybody knows it was Grandma Green, Marjorie Green Street and, and her grandson, Eddie Munster. So with all the people that had built the house, lived in the house, the two, the three or four years that we were there together is what the whole town remembers about that house. And we're like the most famous house in the town. It's funny. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's... There's so much to it, and and that just yeah. kind of adds to it even more, you know. I mean, absolutely, that, that it's great. Well, now, where is Macon close to in Missouri? If you look at the map, it's between St. Louis and Kansas City, dead dead between the two, but you have to elevate up elevate up about 100 miles. So it's in the northern part of the state, between St. Louis and Kansas City, up towards Iowa. Oh, okay. Because somebody was asking the other day, and um, I said. I, don't know. All I've heard of is Macon, Georgia, which is not even close. No. Um, it's, uh, it's a couple about two. Uh, it's above Springfield in Columbia, about sixty miles north of Columbia. Okay. So why do you think after the last people left that the house stayed vacant for so long? It's only been vacant two years. Okay. Yeah, they were in, they were in, they were in it for eighteen years. They lived there. The Keithleys lived there for eighteen years, and they've been out of it now two years, uh, maybe two and a half now. And then before that. When I went back there 20 years ago, the Keithleys weren't in there. There was another family that I believe had bought the house from my grandma uh, and been there about 20 years. So there had been like a couple of fairly long-term tenants. Right. Uh, grandma Grandma only lived in it when, when she was only in it for about six or seven years. She didn't really own it that long because then she moved up. She she, she downsized again as she got older and she had an auction and the people from all over the world showed up to get all her antiques and then she moved to Idaho um, to get away, just to, she always wanted to go back to the small town atmosphere up in Idaho. That's where she wound up staying the rest of her life. Well, here's the other thing about antiques and, and with shows like Haunted Collector. Um, you know, there are cases where spirits are attached to certain antiques. And if she had a house full of them, she might have brought some spirit with her, which is, Bonnie, what you might be seeing some of those other layers too. And maybe yeah. they just liked the place and stayed as well. Well, that's what that's I'm really wondering possible. because the you know what what's in the little box that Michelle saw the the lady in white was looking down at this little box. What's in that little box, and is that something that actually Butch's grandma had picked up at some point in time? Mm-hmm. And maybe yeah. she did get brought into the house, and maybe she's still there. You know, we we have to ask her those questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, it's interesting. Because that house was like. Well, the house was like, it really was an extremely busy house in there. I mean, my grandma had a lot of antiques. I mean, a lot. Waldo. I mean, it was like living in a museum. Um, wow. Very much she specialized. She specialized in uh, Lincoln glass and uh, stained glass shades for her specialty. But she had just everything and everything. And it was funny. Even as she got older, she could remember. I, I used to pick up anything in the house, and she would tell me exactly where she bought it, what she paid for it. You know, and this and this and this and this. So, you know, I mean, I grew up around this stuff, so I became pretty educated not to break stuff and, you know, don't rough house in the house. <laughs> don't, don't rough in the house. You know, you break something. But it was really neat that she would have these Lincoln rockers and she would buy them on one side of the border where they, they hated Lincoln and she'd take them up the other side of the border where they loved Lincoln and, you know, quadruple her money. And it was just, it was very interesting. And then when she married Bill, you know, my grandfather, uh, by marriage, he was just a hundred of fishermen. So, you know, it was lucky for me. I had the best of both worlds. My grandma showed me the country. And then when she married Bill, you know, he, I was out in the woods and fishing and having a great time as, as a little boy should. So that was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just, you know, as you're talking, I, all of a sudden this antique thing popped into my head and, hmm, that could account for some of the stuff that Bonnie's um, sure. picking up already. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. I, although I'm, I'm kind of a little bit leery about getting things from antique shops. Um, I'm always thinking something's going to come home with me, and um, very brave person here, but uh, it, it's it's just so possible, and I, I kind of like that. And has anybody? I'm okay. You've got the basement. I'm sure there's an attic, right? Don't oh yeah, too. Exactly. Have attics. We had to look at that as if, if the bed and breakfast became successful, if we needed more bedrooms. We could throw easily four more bedrooms in this attic. It's huge. So I wonder if anybody has kind of maybe dug up a floorboard here and there or, you know, um, looked for things that weren't 
open to the common eye, you know, to see. Yeah. Because I think what will that, happen. I, I think what will happen when Bonnie gets back there will be not only is it the house, the grandma's house, but the house across the street is an incredible piece of. I mean, it's like that's why my sister was like so. This guy had like a ballroom on the second floor of this house. I mean, this house was incredible. It probably yeah. cost hundred thousand. How much? Third floor ballroom. And my sister just walking by. But anyway, I had a third floor ballroom, and I mean, the house probably cost back then. It probably cost twenty or thirty thousand dollars to build. I mean, it's incredible. It's just an incredible yeah. house, and that's the tunnel across the way, and that's the one that had the big gates and the big, you know, the wrought iron fence around it. So just mm-hmm. having that as your neighborhood house right across. I'm sure we're going to find all kinds of neat stuff because I think that they were thinking that these ghosts, I don't know if ghosts can go back and forth between two houses, but there was a talk that they might be, you know, a connection between the two houses and there might be um, ghosts, you know, a ghost passageway through this tunnel or something. I don't know. We're going to find mm-hmm. out. Yeah, don't, don't we think that the houses were all built for or by the same family? I think they're all part of the yeah. Wardell family, right? Yeah, the big one, the big one was the, the head for Wardell guy built that one for him. And then every time his kids would get married, he'd build them another house. And that's why there's four of them. So um, they, they, were, they were like wedding presents. So if the families traveled in the tunnels when they were alive, they could possibly travel in the tunnels sure. after death. Well, and one of the things that I see some people ask, ask my sister on eBay, they go, we live in Bacon, and we're kind of like amateur ghost hunters. Would you mind, can we have permission to go on the property? And Michelle said, sure, you know, go ahead, knock yourself out. And they can report it back that the two things that had happened while they were there that they found very interesting was, number one, apparently they placed a ping pong ball on a windowsill and left and came back and it had moved. But it had moved in such a manner that it was still exactly where it was with the spot, uh, the, the, the uh, belt pin spot on it on the other end of it, which wouldn't have rolled it wouldn't have rolled that way. It would have to have been placed. And then number two is they, it was a 93 degree day and they put thermometers out and the temperature on the porch never wavered between 62 and 63 degrees all day long, which oh. she thought that was, that was pretty strange because it was a very warm day. And uh, the porch gives a little bit of shade, but not a 30 degrees worth of shade. So yeah. for what it's worth. That could be a sign. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> When you guys think you're heading out to to start doing a little bit of um, preliminary work paranormally, soon as soon as Bonnie can travel. Okay, I'm, going, I'm going back to I'm going back to the Midwest after the first of the year. I've already got bookings and stuff, so I'm going to be pretty much all over the Midwest doing what I do. So um, for me, like I said, I have to go live somewhere. So I'm hoping that John and the bank come to terms very quickly, and once they do, and the keys are handed over, I'll be there. That sounds very cool. Um, so the hour is flying by really quickly as usual. So where can people find out more about the house and what both of you guys are up to these days? Go ahead, buddy. Okay, for uh, for information on the Macon House, it's butch-patrick.com, and then look for Macon House. And my website is bonnevent.com. And Butch's website is Munsters.com. Very cool. So what have you guys Of course, got? we're on Facebook and Twitter and all of those things, too. All those social media things. And for me, basically, I'm uh, next year, personal appearances, a lot of them, the radio show development. Um, got the book and the stories and developing, getting the writers and the formats and the editors in place. So that book comes out on time, September 24th. 50 years to the day. It's going to be called a Munster's, a Munster's Memor- The Munster Memories in a Coffin Table Book Format. We're going to have pop-ups, pop, pop-ups and pictures and all kinds of good stuff. It's going to be a very limited edition. We're going to keep the numbers down, but it's going to be really cool. Um, I'll be touring with the Munster Coach and the Dragula. We're going to be doing a lot of car shows. And uh, that's one of the neat things about the Munsters. Is I have a chance to do not only the ink and the tattoo angle because of uh, so many people have Munster tattoos, but I also do car shows and collectible memorabilia shows, and probably after this, maybe a few paranormal shows. Who knows? Maybe there might be some paranormal conventions for me and Bonnie to go frequent. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be cool. Well, I was, yeah. was going to say, you've met all of the, the Paracelebs. You've met all the people from Ghost Hunters and Jason and Grant. Yeah. And, yeah. At the start, there's not a lot of... Huge fan. 
there's not a lot of people out there that aren't curious about Eddie Munster's childhood home in, in Missouri, you know, in this Queen Anne home. It draws a lot of interesting people and, and, you know, attention to it on its own. And then the fact that, you know, kind of city boy moves back home to his country roots thing, it, it makes it for good uh, programming and, you know, good script writing. So we're hoping somebody will see the light and take advantage of it. Well, I yeah, think we, they if should. we do get it sold as a show, we, we're going to travel as well because Butch goes to all these conventions anyhow, and people come up to him and say, you know, oh, yeah, there's like this weird thing going on in this area. And, and so yep. we can go investigate those based, you know, just from the locations where, where he goes for conventions and things like that. So we can check out other properties as well. But the, uh, the Macon House will be home, home base. And also uh, where the lab so like is. Mission, mission control for the for the ghost for the ghost chasers. <laughs> That's yes, right. or belfry control, one of the two, right? <laughs> you betcha. We just got to get a couple of bats in there, and we'll be good to go. Well, no I, I really want to thank you guys for joining us tonight because um, when Bonnie was telling me about the project, I thought, oh, this this is great. This is just fantastic, and. It's kind of good because sometimes when you put stuff out to the universe, the universe listens. So this way you're putting it out and a lot of people are hearing about it and probably with a lot of good thoughts to make it all happen, all fall into place the way you want it to be. So I really appreciate you both being here. Oh, thank, thank you. you very much. Too, Marla. Have a great holiday, everyone. Yes, everybody do. And um, please do come back and, and keep us posted on what's going on with the house and the project and everything because I think um, everybody would like to hear about it. Okie dokie, I can do and that. And there's a whole bunch of people in our chat room that want to go and investigate the house, just so you know. <laughs> Not <laughs> okay. We've been there, okay? Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, you've got dibs. You've absolutely got dibs. But we, we, we will, we'll, it'll make for a nice housewarming, a nice housewarming and open house for the town and for the people coming in from out of town. It'll be a great party. Yes, it will. So absolutely keep us posted. And um, stay on the line for just a second. We'll thank you properly. And I want to thank everybody for listening in tonight. The chat room was spilling over, so I hope you guys didn't get all squished in the process. And um, until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Martha Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron staring. Any rebroadcast or use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2013. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. <laughs>